Right. Welcome. Welcome, Derek Walker, to the Acad Ministries platform tonight. And before you begin to speak, I just want to ask you a couple of simple questions. Why do you believe that um, that the church should be awake uh, at this time and understand that um, that we are in the end times? Well, I've, I think uh, if if we understand that we're in the end times, of course, I believe there's all kinds of signs. And one of them is is Israel, of course, back in the land. That's the, the obvious sign from the scripture that we are in the end times. Um, and, and really, uh, the effect of understanding that is very much to wake, wake us up, wake up the church and uh, realize, you know, time is short. We need to use, you know, the remaining time we have to, uh, you know, pray, to witness, to save the lost, to do God's will for our life. We, we can't afford to uh, just sit and, uh, you know, do nothing because uh, we, we must serve God with all our heart. And just knowing we should do that anyway, but knowing that we are, uh, Jesus is coming very soon, should alert us and inspire us all, all the more. Right. So why do you believe the church really should be a praying for Israel? Um, because you can't really pray for um, end times without understanding God's purposes for Israel. And yet there are there are churches that will talk about end times, but they won't. But they don't bring Israel into focus and Israel's not part of um how they see the end times why do you think it's so important that the church grasp this concept about israel well hopefully in my talk today it'll, i'll i'll be uh making that very clear that um if you've got an integrated understanding of the scriptures is israel is central to the whole bible and certainly central to the end times and 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 what is coming to pass on the earth the the problem is i think that uh, partly we're the victims of a lot of church history where, where the, the you know replacement theology has kind of taken over a large part of the church and so you know um it's we can we it's like we we're looking at scripture um with a huge blind spot we don't see israel or when we see israel we think it means the church and and so we interpret everything through the lens of, of the church and so we managed to sideline israel and or consign it to the past and therefore people do not read the scriptures if they did even the new testament scriptures they would realize that israel's at the very center of god's purposes and indeed israel's repentance and salvation is is the very key uh, event that must take place before jesus returns and therefore you know, if you just take scripture literally, you you can't miss Israel. You know that in the New Testament as well is absolutely central to God's purposes. So, uh, yeah, sadly, it's because the scriptures aren't being taught uh, as the, as they ought to be. Uh, yeah, but I, I guess the bottom line reason it's a spiritual reason. It's a it's a deception by the enemy that uh, causes people to. Uh, just ignore Israel. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. I just wanted to just bring those two key points and um, and you've explained them beautifully. So um, you may carry on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Praise God. I'll get going, shall I? And yes, the, the topic, of course, is Israel in the end times. I am convinced we are in the end times uh, because of, of the signs. Um, and we're going to see that Israel is very much at the center and always has been in the center of God's purposes. Um, I think I want to start in talking about the end times. No better place than to start, really, than the teaching of Jesus himself. And, and so I think we'll go to the uh, Matthew 23 to start with. And, and this, of course, is just taking place just after jesus has made his triumphal entry 
I believe that uh, Jesus came and he obviously came the first time to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins to establish the new covenant. But I believe he also came, um, hypothetically at least, to offer the kingdom to Israel. When Jesus preached, uh, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. To the Jewish ears, they would have understood. Of course, that 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 is the a personal message to each person. The kingdom of God is at hand, you know, and therefore calling for a personal response to receive the Messiah. But also it was a message to the nation that here is the son of David. Here is the anointed king of Israel. And he is declaring he is on the scene and the kingdom is at hand. And had they actually received Jesus as the Messiah, uh, had Israel received Jesus as the Messiah, he would have been able to establish the kingdom. They would have accepted the new covenant and he would have established the kingdom. And uh, he he says that really in, in Luke, in Luke 19, maybe I should go there quickly, when he is making his triumphal entry, he is actually making the, according to Zechariah 9, the official presentation of himself as the king, as Israel's king. And of course, he knows as he is making this triumphal entry that he is presenting himself officially to the leadership as the king. And the people, of course, were giving the messianic greeting uh, in, say, in verse 38. They are shouting, you know, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And they, they are officially receiving him. But of course, the response of the Pharisees and the leaders was to reject him as their king. And um, because of the covenants that were set up, we're going to explain it for, for Christ to to establish his kingdom on the earth. Um, it is necessary for Israel to receive him as their king and put their faith in him as their king. So it says in verse 41, Luke 19, 41, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it because he knew what was in the heart of the leaders. And he says, if you know, had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, your shalom, now they are hidden from your eyes. And, and in other words, Israel could have entered into a time of peace under the Messiah. And yet, they, because they refused him, he then announces the judgment that was going to come on them, particularly in AD 70, when they would be destroyed by the Romans. and. Um, and so here we, we have an example of the fact that Jesus came. He accomplished salvation. He was re ready and willing to establish the kingdom then. But Israel rejected the kingdom. And so they could not possess it at that time. And so God did not reject Israel at this time. But the kingdom was postponed. Uh, for for 2000 years it's a bit like god gave them the opportunity to possess the promised land uh under Mo, you know at the time of moses but because of their unbelief they had to wander uh in the wilderness for 40 years before joshua led them into the promised land and in the same way israel failed to enter the promised land of the kingdom that had been promised to them through their covenants, through the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, but they could, they did not possess it because of unbelief, and so they had to wander in the wilderness of the nations for, I, I would say, forty jubilees. And so, but God is not finished with Israel, and God will fulfill His purpose for Israel, and through the greater than Joshua, He will bring Israel into her fullness into the fulfillment of all the covenants that God made. And um, let me just quickly say what these covenants were. God promised to Abraham and re reinforced it to Isaac and Jacob, what we would call an unconditional covenant, an everlasting covenant. God has guaranteed that he will bring these covenants to pass. And, um, and then these covenants were developed in three ways. First of all, there was the promise of the land. 
And, and of course, if a group of people have a piece of land, then they're also a nation. So it's the promise of the land and a nation. And that was confirmed by the land covenant that God made with Moses. And that's right at the end of Deuteronomy, where the, the promise of the land was reaffirmed. And that's the first development. The second development was the Davidic covenant, which promised the, a, a, a ruler who would be the, an everlasting king, the son of David, who would reign forever. And not just over Israel, but over the whole world. That's the Davidic covenant. And then the third covenant that was promised to Israel was the promise that gave them their spiritual uh, salvation and their spiritual blessing uh, that would be brought in by the Messiah, which we call the new covenant. And that's the basis for their spiritual blessing and also their abundance uh, in, in the promised land. And it was, was of a nature that they had to receive the Messiah and enter into the new covenant um, before they qualified, as it were, to possess their kingdom, or the, the fulfillment of all, of all the covenants. So God's plan for Israel, as I say, is to fulfill all the covenants to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And those will be fulfilled in the time period we call the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. Praise God. He when he he returns, he will bring Israel into her absolute fullness. All these covenants will be fulfilled through through the son of Abraham and the, the, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And so these covenants that God made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and David and through Moses, too. These are the covenants that control the outworking of all history, you see. And all history is actually centered on God's chosen people, Israel. Um, and so when the Messiah came the first time, um, of course, God knew this would happen. But uh, sadly, his people as a nation rejected his um, rejected him as as king. And in, if we go now to Matthew uh, tw uh, 23, the whole chapter is a rebuke, a judgment, if you like, uh, by Jesus on Israel for their sin and their rejection of him. And then he concludes Matthew 23 by saying in verse 37 to 39, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, because that is the, the leadership of Israel. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I would have want, wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. This is the, the rejection of Christ as, as the Messiah King. See, now it's the consequences, judgment. See your house, that's the temple, is left to you desolate. So he's predicting the destruction of the temple. For I say to you, you will not see me anymore until, and I love that until, all right, not forever. God has not finished with Israel. Israel's under discipline right now because of her rejection of the Messiah. But you will not see me no more until you say, until the leadership of Israel says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that, of course, is the messianic greeting, the messianic welcome. That is Israel receiving uh, Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And that, you see, is the basis for the second coming. He promises the moment Israel repents, calls on him, receives him as the Messiah, um, then he will return in power and glory and establish his kingdom on earth with Israel as the chief nation. So you see that here in the teaching of Jesus, Israel is at the center of world events and, and the very key to the second coming of Christ. And then as we move into verse uh, chapter 24, it says that Jesus went out and departed from the temple and that's a prophetic action. This is the glory of God leaving the temple. You know, when Israel sinned in the days of, um, you know, um, 600 BC and so on, when the first temple was destroyed, 
the Ezekiel saw the glory of God leaving the temple and going out onto the Mount of Olives. Well, exactly the same thing is happening here. The glory of God, Jesus Christ, is now departing the temple for the last time. He doesn't return. And he, he and the disciples try and cheer him up. He's obviously in a, in a serious mood and says they want to show him the buildings of the temple. Aren't they great? You know, and Jesus says, look, assuredly, I say to you, no, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, this temple is now going to be destroyed because the glory has now left the temple. And then it says he went up the, the Mount of Olives he, and he sat on the Mount of Olives. Again, the glory of God going on to the Mount of Olives. And ultimately, you know, after uh, 40 plus days from now, um, he will ascend into heaven from the Mount of Olives, just as it was in Ezekiel's day. And, um, and then the disciples ask him about the end times, really. They, they, when will these things be? And that's the question about when, when will the temple be destroyed? And the answer to that question, by the way, is recorded in Luke 21. And then it says, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Uh, by the way, those are two different questions. The, his coming, of course, is the second coming. But the end of the age is a different word. It's suntelia. It means the consummation of the age. Or the tribulation in other words it's not the final end but it's the end period for instance if, if i come to the last five minutes of my talk that's not the final end that's the consummation of my talk that's the that's what this word means the end of the the age is the final period of the age which we call the tribulation so they want to know about the tribulation they want to know about the second coming and they also want to know about the temple and as we look at this, we're going to see in Jesus's description of the end times that Israel is very much in the middle of the action. All right. And, and that is not an accident. It's because Israel is still at the center of God's God's purposes. Uh, a quick look at Luke 21. Um, we'll see just just a little piece out of this. Um, in 21, he describes um, Luke 21 verse 20 he describes the destruction of the temple um, in the in that generation you you will see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its desolation is near then let those in Judea flee to the mountains and and so forth this actually happened I think in about I'm not sure let's say AD 68 the um or early in the war, maybe even AD 66, they, the Romans attacked Jerusalem, surrounded Jerusalem. And it looked like um, this was the sign that Jesus was, was giving them, that the temple was about to be destroyed. And you might think, well, it's a bit late because if, the, if it, Jerusalem's surrounded by armies, how can they escape? They're already trapped. But in fact, the 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 Roman uh, general was uh, too hasty. He didn't have enough supply lines, and and so he couldn't. Jerusalem was not an easy capital to 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 capture, and so because it was an ill-conceived attack, the Romans withdrew, and but the Christians knew that this was the sign. Um, most of the the Jews were were you know celebrating their victory, but. This was actually the sign Jesus gave that soon it will be destroyed. And the Christians actually believing Jesus prophecy managed to escape in the in the next few years. Uh, they escaped to to Pella, many of them. And um, then, of course, the Roman legions returned. And in AD 70, they actually destroyed the temple. And, and then in verse 24, he says, and these and they, that's, you know, the, the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all nations. So here it predicts because Israel's rejection of Christ, she will be scattered to the nations. She'll lose her land and her nationhood. And then Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So again, is the the. 
The negative news is Jerusalem will be taken over by the Gentiles. They will be scattered to the nations, but not forever until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And, and I believe um, that, that that's happened because Israel back in the land right now tells us that a significant change has happened. That is a real marker of the end times because God's purpose for Israel has not finished. Uh, okay, so notice that the, there's the hint there that Israel will be and Jerusalem will be restored in the end times. Um, that, that scattering of Israel will not be forever, but Israel will re be regathered. All right. So now as we look into Matthew 24, I'm going to jump over a lot of this. I just want to notice that as you look at Matthew 24, it describes lots of the signs that are going to take place in the end times. But I just want to focus on one of them. If you go into verse 15, um, he talks about the abomination. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, um, which is the temple, um, whoever reads, let him understand. And what he's saying is, you need to read, understand Daniel's prophecies. All right. So he's saying, if you want to understand the end times, you've got to understand Daniel. And of course, this is a reference to Daniel 927, which predicts that, um, which is in the, the prophecy of Daniel 70 weeks, which, by the way, is perhaps the uh, a very challenging prophecy. I've written a book on it. You can get it from Amazon called uh, Daniel 70 weeks. But uh, in Daniel 924, it specifically says this is a prophecy about Israel. And it's, a, it's about 490 years that God has allocated to fulfill got his plan for Israel. Now, what it talks about is the last seven years of those 490 years, um, it talks about Israel making a covenant with the Antichrist. And that requires Israel to be a nation, you see, in back in the land right at the end. In fact, the importance of Israel in the end times, I could summarize with this thought, that if you look at all the prophecies of what's going to take place in the end times, the stage for the fulfillment of most of these prophecies is Israel. In other words, for the prophecies of the end times to take to be fulfilled, Israel must be back in the land. That's mm -hmm. the necessary setting of the stage for the final showdown, for the final thing. Because, for instance, Antichrist gathers all the armies of the world where to Israel. Megiddo initially, and then to attack Jerusalem and so on. So Jesus returns. Where does he return to? Not New York. He returns to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. So in other words, Israel is center stage. And that is not a coincidence. All right. That can only mean that Israel plays a vital role. Um, why does the Antichrist gather under the inspiration of Satan? Why does he gather all the armies of the world to destroy Israel? Because Satan knows that God has committed himself by covenant to establish his kingdom on the earth through Israel. And therefore, if he can destroy Israel, and this is why Satan through Hitler and other people uh, and this is the nature of the spirit of anti-Semitism, is Satan's attempt to wipe Israel off the map and to destroy the Jews, because he knows that that's the only way he can stop God's plan coming to pass. And of course, it's, an, it's a foolish endeavor. But uh, nevertheless, God has committed himself by covenant to Israel to bring his purposes to pass through Israel. And that's why there is this attack on Israel and this attempt to destroy Israel because she plays a unique role as the elect nation. And so um, 
we we need to understand the kind of spiritual warfare going on over Israel. That's why, as it were, it's such a hot topic that a lot of people want to leave alone. But um, I believe that one of the signs of being saved is that, that you will love Israel because it says the love of God has been shed abroad in, in your heart by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5. And um, Jeremiah 31, 3, that we like to apply to ourselves and we rightly apply it to ourselves. But when he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have called you to myself, that is speaking first about Israel. God loves Israel. He has chosen Israel. And therefore, um, if we have the love of God in our hearts, we, we should love Israel, uh, despite her sins or, or so, so forth, because that, God's, that is God's heart for Israel. And, and so um, we, what we'll see in, Dan, in Daniel's prophecy is an example where Israel is back in the land for the certainly for the last seven years because antichrist makes this seven-year covenant with israel and then it says halfway through and in that covenant he uh uses his um might as it were there's some kind of deal is made and that allows israel to have her temple uh functioning again and so israel antichrist will that will be the sweetener for israel in this covenant that she will have the temple for a brief time for three and a half years and during that time um, um actually through the two witnesses god's going to use that it, it's it's actually called some people call it the antichrist temple but actually in two thessalonians it's called the temple of god and here it's called the holy place. So it will be an actual temple of God um, because God's going to use it as an outreach. Now, the Orthodox Jews will think it's that a chance for them to reinstate their temple worship of the old covenant. But God has another plan. You see, God's going to use the two witnesses who are going to preach the gospel uh, and they're going to dominate the temple. So all the Israelites are going to come to the temple but the two witnesses are going to be preaching the gospel. They're going to be witnessing to Christ and they'll be saying the final sacrifice has been made and many will be saved through the, you know, because they will do many miracles and so forth. And so uh, halfway through those seven years, the Antichrist breaks the covenant with Israel. He invades the um, East Jerusalem and he kills the two witnesses and he takes over the temple and then he desecrates the temple by placing the abomination of desolation in the temple which is probably some kind of idol to himself the image of the beast and then he starts commanding the world to worship him and and so he desecrates god's holy place so jesus refers to that prophecy of daniel um, and, and by the way, that brings down desolating judgments from God. That's why it's called the abomination of desolation. Jesus references this event in Israel. So I want you to notice in Jesus's description of the end times, it's centered on Israel and on the temple. And he says, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel, then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. He says, get out of there. And, and the reason that they should flee is in verse 21 for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor shall ever be and so this will be the the last three and a half years are going to be the worst ever that's when antichrist becomes uh, the world's dictator if you like and he is given uh, 1260 days of world power and that's going to be the worst time ever and um and then it says in verse 22, unless those days are shortened, and that's shortened by the return of Christ, um, no flesh will be saved. That's how bad things are going to get. But for the elect's sake. Now, again, the, many people like to think of the church here. We're the elect. But actually, that's true. But that, that concept of us being the elect only came in after, you know, later 
when Jesus spoke these words, it's clear how the original hearers would have understood him. The elect is Israel. And it's for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And here's another statement that Jesus is going to return for Israel's sake. He is returning to save Israel from the Antichrist. Uh, because by the end of the tribulation, Israel will be calling on Jesus to save them. Uh, but I just want to see how this prophecy is centered on events in Israel. Um, and then an interesting thing, then he gets to his own coming in verse 27. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles, I prefer vultures actually, there the vultures will be gathered together. And, and actually, that's an explanation of where, where will this take place? Well, the carcass is Israel. The armies of Antichrist see Israel like a, a carcass to be finished off. And then therefore these vultures are gathered together to Israel. Um, and that is therefore where Jesus will return. He will return to Israel to save Israel from, from the vultures, as it were. And, and so I just wanted to point out there that a big part of this prophecy is centered on Israel. Israel is the center stage for the fulfillment of prophecy. And how Christians cannot see the centrality of Israel. Now, if it is true that Israel is now, you know, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises. So Israel does not matter as a nation anymore. Israel is a historical accident, as it were. Um, then that does not explain why prophecy in the Old Testament and the New Testament focuses on Israel as the center of the events and the center of the spiritual warfare. And, and so, sadly, there's a tradition in the in the uh, Christian church of not taking prophecy seriously or literally. And so it's all kind of spiritualized away. But um I want to really focus now on something that I love myself, and I think I, I learned this, some of this first from Lance Lambert. In verse 32, he says, now learn this parable from the fig tree, or learn the parable of the fig tree. And the fig tree, as, we, as we'll see in a minute, is a reference to Israel. And, and here he is talking about the number one sign of the end times learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch is already become tender and puts forth leaves you know that summer is near so also when you see all these things know that it is near and it's really talking about the kingdom the kingdom is near it's talking about the, the signs of the second coming assuredly i say to you this generation will not by no means pass away till all these things take place um and let me just talk about the parable of the fig tree that Jesus points out. Now, we, you know, some people that deny the fact that this is Israel, but the fig tree consistently in the Bible is symbolized, uh, symbolizes Israel. Um, I'll rattle off some scriptures, but I'll, the main scripture, I would say, is Luke 13. But uh, Jeremiah 24, Amos 8. Hosea 9, Joel 1, and Ezekiel 36. But I want to take you to actually where Jesus actually gave the parable of the fig tree. When he said, you know, take this lesson from the parable of the fig tree, um, he, he, the disciples knew exactly what he was talking about because he gave them the parable of the fig tree in Luke 13. And um, let's go there to Luke 13, verse 5 to 9. It says, unless um, you repent, verse 5, Luke 13, verse 5, unless you, Israel, repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. This is the parable of the fig tree. A certain man, and that's Jesus, had a fig tree. As we read on, we'll see it's Israel planted in his vineyard. That's the, the holy land. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. This is Jesus looking for faith, but he doesn't find any. 
Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, that's the father, look for three years. So this is three years into the ministry of Jesus. For three years, I have come seeking fruit on the fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? In other words, judgment. Remove it from the vineyard. It's talking about Israel being removed from the land. But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also till I dig around and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, and if not, after that, you can cut it down. So this is talking about God giving Israel an extra year of grace. So, so three years plus one year is four years. Now, we know Jesus ministry was three and a half years. So this takes us to six months after the cross. Um, I don't have time to develop this, but I believe that is Stephen's speech. That's the speech of the prosecutor against um, the leaders of Israel. And when they martyred Stephen, they were confirming that the leaders were confirming their rejection of Christ. And then they were spiritually cut off at that point. And um, that's where judgment came on Israel. And uh, that's when the gospel went out to the Samaritans and then to the Gentiles and so forth. Um, and, and so what we have now is that soon after that parable of the fig tree was fulfilled, Israel was cut down. The fig tree was cut down and removed from the land. So that's that's the first stage of the parable of the fig tree. It's all about the fig tree and whether it bears fruit or not. And then if you remember, uh, Jesus, um, on the day after his triumphal entry, when he was rejected by the leaders, he came into over the Mount of Olives and he cursed the fig tree because it did not bear any fruit. This was a prophetic action. Again, the meaning of the parable, it wasn't just that he was in a bad mood and took it out on the nearest fig tree. Clearly, this was a gift of faith that God gave him because this was a prophetic parable. Again, because Israel had not borne fruit, that therefore judgment uh, would come on Israel. That's uh, the disciples didn't ask why did he do that? They were more impressed by how he did it and so he he explained well you've got to have the faith of god and you've got to speak and believe that what you say will come to pass and so on and uh and and so on but um it's interesting that uh he then said uh, whoever says to this mountain be removed and be cast in the sea it will be done for you and of course at the second coming we read in Zechariah that Jesus will indeed speak to the Mount of Olives and, and, he, and move it by his words. But um, on that later, and then the next morning, they discovered that the fig tree was dried up, withered up from the roots. So there was a spiritual cutting off, and then that manifested physically. And in the same way, Israel was cut off spiritually in AD 33, and that was manifested physically in AD 70 when she was cast out of the land. Um, and then the next morning, as I say, they, they found this fig tree withered up and they were very impressed by that. And then the, later that same day, Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse sitting on the Mount of Olives, right next to, or close to, the fig tree that had been withered up. All right, so there's a context to this. There's, when he says the sign of the end time is the fig tree, they understood exactly what he was saying, that they understood the parable of the fig tree, that the fig tree is Israel, that the fig tree would be cut down and removed from the land but he says when you see the fig tree arise again and put forth its leaves then you know you are in the end times 
all right this is the number one sign of being in the end times the israel has to come back into the land as a nation to set the scene for the end time prophecies and they would have understood that the fig tree is israel but notice that and there are that israel in the, the when israel comes back to the land it is just bearing leaves not fruit and this is in line with many uh, prophecies in the Old Testament. Um, in my book, The Pan a Panorama of Prophecy, I, I, I give you all the scriptures on this, but I can uh, get, just give you an overview, really, that um, the prophecies say that Israel will be regathered from the nations, and but it, initially it will be a partial regathering in unbelief. All right, and that's the fig tree bearing leaves not in faith so some people say well israel you know that isn't a work of god israel as a nation is not a work of god because israel do not believe as a whole uh, a minority of messianic jews yes but as a whole israel is not in faith so how can god be involved in that but actually that's exactly what the bible predicts in ezekiel he puts it like this i don't do it for your sake israel i do it for my own namesake because I'm a covenant keeping God and Israel, God is bringing uh, God's stage one is that he brings her back to the land. And then the next stage is God will deal with her in the land and, and especially in the tribulation. And she will come back to the Lord. And by the end of the tribulation, Israel will all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be calling on the Lord for to deliver her from the Antichrist. And so the, the initial regatherings in unbelief, then when she comes back in the land, she will start bearing fruit. And ultimately, then Christ will return as Israel is calling on her for salvation on him for salvation and then he will complete the regathering of israel it says in isaiah 27 says he'll blow the great trumpet and regather the all the remaining people of israel from from all the different nations back to the land and jesus talked about that in matthew 24 31 he says from the four ends of the earth from the four winds of heaven he will blow the great trumpet and regather israel back to the land and he will complete the 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 restoration of israel and israel will be fully restored and regathered in faith and then the thousand year reign of christ will, will begin but israel is is absolutely central to all of this it's interesting that in the in the sign of the fig tree he says when you see the fig tree again putting forth its leaves then this generation, that is the generation that sees the sign, will not pass away until all these things have come to pass. And that tells me that um, it's a man's lifetime. It's a man's lifetime. The generation that sees 1948 will not all pass away. So it, it, that puts a limit uh, as to how, how long it could be. So we're already... How many years are we now? <laughs> 75, is it? Um, I got that right. So anyway, 75 years. Um, but the generation that sees 1948 will not. Always. So this is how I know myself that we are in the end times. We're well into the end times because of the sign of the fig tree. And um, as a result, we we need under, need to understand that uh, we should pray for of course we pray for all people but we should definitely pray for Israel because that is the the focus they're the focus of satanic attack they're the focus of God's purposes and when Israel returns to the Lord uh, and that that is happening you know slowly more and more Jews are coming to faith each of those is a sign uh, you know of the coming of the lord but um it's uh it is uh very significant that uh, the place of israel in the plan of god as i said 
Israel, God is so chosen to to limit himself that uh, he will establish his kingdom on earth according to the covenants he has made. And those covenants require that Israel must accept the Lord. And, and that is going to happen. It may look almost impossible to see that happening right now, but lots of things are going to happen very fast, uh, and especially in the, in the tribulation. So praise God. Um, I want to take you, I think, to Hosea. It's another favorite prophecy of mine. Hosea, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Now, I know I am, t I, I have to finish being with you at 20 past. So I'll aim to finish at 10 past in case there are any questions, because I've, I'm teaching a small Bible school um, at half past seven. So I just need those 10 minutes to, to, to turn around, as it were. Hosea uh, chapter five, and we'll start in verse 15. Uh, no, verse 14. And this is a prophecy of the Messiah, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim, to Israel, and like a long, young lion to the house of Judah. In other words, he comes as the king, claiming kingship. But it, things don't seem to go well, because it says, I, even I, will tear them and go away. So instead of blessing is, is judgment. And he will leave Israel. I will take them away. And the implication is he is going to remove them from, from the land because they reject him. And no one will rescue. And then he says, I will return again to my place. And of course, Jesus ascended to heaven uh, in AD 33. Until there's that wonderful word again. I will return to my place. Remember, Jesus said to the leaders, you will not see me again until. OK. Until they acknowledge their offense there's one particular sin one particular offense that israel must acknowledge and uh, and repent of and that is of course their official rejection by the messiah uh, it's a rejection of christ and uh, they even made a judicial rejection of christ by the sanhedrin that judgment has to be reversed that requires Israel to be a nation again and for the leadership in Jerusalem to actually um, repent of that judgment. And then it says, till they acknowledge their offense, then they will seek my face in their affliction, in the tribulation, they will earnestly seek me. So they will um, turn to, to God uh, more and more, as in, particularly in the times of trouble. And this is the words they will use. And this is near. This is in the tribulation. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn. Yeah, they, they accept that they have been under judgment, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Chapter six, verse two. After two days, he will revive us. I believe that's a hint because a day with the Lord is a thousand years. That's a hint. That after two days, after 2000 years, he will raise us. He will revive us. And on the third day, and that is the third day will be the millennium, the thousand year day of the Lord, the millennium. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth from heaven is established as the morning. In other words, they they are. They are. This is the final repentance of Israel, and they are calling. They are repenting, and they are sure that He is going to appear like the sun appears in the morning, and His light, His glory, is going to fill the earth. And mm -hmm. then they will live. Uh, he will come to us as the rain. It's, it's talking about the spiritual blessings that they will enjoy in the millennium. So, this predicts. Um, the rejection of the Messiah, but that ultimately Israel will repent and re put her trust in Christ, receive him as the Messiah, and then he will appear in glory 
and he will establish his kingdom on the earth. So the reason why, if I was just to summarize this, um, and, and, and this is actually a very big subject. Once you bring in Ezekiel and uh, all the prophets, they all see, uh, see this. They, they predict that Israel will be scattered, but also she will be regathered to the land. And in the land, God's going to deal with Israel and she is ultimately going to come to faith in the Messiah. And on the basis of that, they will enter into the new covenant, which is the, the basis, really. They're, they are now in right relationship with God. And now God can restore them physically to her full possession of the land, uh, restore the, the, the kingdom. Um, and Jesus will reign from Jerusalem over the whole earth. Praise God. And, and I think I will just take three minutes by quickly taking you to Zechariah. So the bottom line is, once you just take the scriptures literally, what you see is that Israel is at the center of everything. You know, it's not that the church isn't important. Of course, the church has a wonderful purpose that, that God has for the church. I'm not wanting to minimize that. But all I'm saying is there, there's more to the, 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 uh, the workings of God than, than, than the church. And we are, through our prayers and through what we do, we, we are part of what God is doing in the bigger picture. And you see, there's two programs of God. One is the salvation program of God. He wants to save as many people as possible. But there's also the kingdom program of God where he is going to establish his kingdom on earth. And Israel is at the heart of that kingdom program. And God is going to save Israel. And then he can accomplish his kingdom program through Israel. Satan, of course, that's what he's fighting. He wants to set up his kingdom on earth through the Antichrist. He, he wants to, to cut God out of the picture and, and have dominion on earth. And um, that's what's going on right now. And he's, he's going to reach that. It will, it will appear that he's almost achieved that in the tribulation with the Antichrist's world power. But, of course, God's going to not allow that to continue. He's going to judge that. And then God's going to bring in his kingdom. But the battle is over the, the possession of the earth. There's a twofold battle going on over the people of the earth, the souls of the earth. And that's why the gospel is so vital. But there's also a battle over the earth itself. Who has control of the earth? And Israel is central on that. Because only when Israel comes to faith and accepts Christ is there now the basis for Christ to come, the son of David, to come, establish his kingdom and fulfill all the covenants to Israel and bring in Israel into the fullness of blessing. So um, I think often Christians find that hard because we're so me centered, you know, it's all about me and the church and all that. And, and it's difficult to uh, sometimes to step outside and see the bigger picture that actually Israel is, is, is essential. And um, we ought to know that if God does not keep his promises and covenants to Israel, then we're standing on very shaky ground. So if, if God isn't going to keep his promises to Israel, how can we expect he's going to keep his promises to us? And, and so that, that's actually the conclusion in, in, in Romans. Um, but anyway, very quickly in Zechariah, um, chapter 12 describes the Antichrist and Armageddon invading Israel. And it's very dangerous. But even at this height, when it looks like Israel are going to be exterminated, there's this wonderful verse 10, Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, then they will look on me whom they pierced. Now, the speaker is the Lord, Jehovah. But notice, he has been pierced. That is only possible if Jehovah has become a man and was pierced. And they, this is Israel re realizing that Jesus is the God-man Messiah. Yes, they will mourn for him. 
in repentance, you see. And, and this is, then all of chapter 13 describes the national repentance of Israel. And then chapter 14, then, once Israel has repented, chapter 4 describes the second coming. Verse 3, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And later on, it, it says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And all the peoples of the earth will, will worship him uh, and, and honor him at the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and so notice the Old Testament prophecies, of course, talk about Israel as being the center of God's purposes and in they will come into the full blessing in the golden age which we now know as the millennium and the new testament absolutely concurs with that well I, i've kind of rushed a bit through a very big subject but I, I think i'll stop there because of time and just in case maybe i don't know if if i've possibly opened up a lot of questions in your mind i'm not sure but um i'll i'll i'll, I'll hand back to you now and that and uh if there are, are any questions <clears throat> wow well, um derek that was um that was just absolutely um you've given us a feast <laughs> and um this is was a excellent excellent um you know you put it together so beautifully excellently as i said earlier on i believe you're a really great expositor and you it really did expound on that excellently and it's a shame it's in such a short space of time that we we, we 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 can't grasp it all we've grasped some <laughs> and uh we've written some but i really believe that you need to come back again and you need to do this perhaps in a slower time when you've got more time and just really open this out broadly but what i understand of this that israel is key israel is central absolutely pivotal to God's plans here on earth, mm. you know, right from even when we witness to people and people are coming into the body of Christ, you know, when people are being saved, that's all part of God bringing people into the body of Christ, bringing people into the kingdom for, the, you know, this greater manifestation of what you've spoken about that will take place and must take place and you know it, it you, david derek it, at times it really does frustrate me when the church does not grasp this because although they've got certain structures and things but they can't they don't fit well because they haven't got the foundation and you can't put up a house, a well-structured house without the foundation. You've got no firm foundation for which you are drawing from when you want to, to um, make the Mashiach, make Yeshua um, a reality in the lives of people. Because when you throw Israel out, you throw out the identity of who Yeshua is and what he, you know, his Jewishness. You know, we we know he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but we throw out the identity of his Jewishness. And therefore we cut off the roots and the roots is so pivotal to what we need to believe and what we need to understand and, and for grasping God's idea of the kingdom, not how we see the kingdom, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and the church, making the church out to be some greater, um, well, it is an establishment, but making the church to be the end and be all, that as long as we're in the church and we have the church, we don't need anything else, which is an absolute lie. So thank you so much. And 